So many people in the church, people who are supposed to be God's people, look and talk and act like the very people that they're pointing their finger at. They're dodging in the same sins. They're pointing to everyone else in the world and their lives and behavior, but they're not living any better than them. And I'm glad that we have a God who can move us past this. Welcome to the Worship Center in Brian's Road, Maryland where Jesus is saving lives, saving souls, and saving futures. Now here's Dr. Steve Davis with wisdom tips, life treats, and gold nuggets from God's Word. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I'm always praying for the Lord to use me to help people to come to know Him in a real and personal way. And I want to help people in their walk with God, in their relationship with God. I want you to know that I pray for you, our online family, and also our church members and those who come to us live. And I lift you before the Lord. Our prayer team lifts you before the Lord. We ask Him to minister to your needs. You know, there are so many distractions, so many demands on our time and energies and so many temptations that it's easy to let your relationship with God get pushed aside. And you know, that's my biggest concern is your relationship with God. My relationship with God is my greatest treasure on the earth and for eternity. And for all my other relationships to be healthy and getting better, I have to have that healthy relationship with God. And that's only possible through Jesus Christ. And I believe you want that too. Our relationship with God isn't a one and done kind of thing. You know, it's not just about sometime way back when, when we got scared and cried out for help and he helped us. Or maybe you were 12 years old and went to VBS or a church camp and they had you come up and pray a little prayer with the rest of the 12 year olds and then maybe neglected it ever since then, except when you're scared. You know, you could be saved, but not have a good close relationship with the Lord. It's sort of like this. I know married people who are married because of a vow they made in a 15 or 20 minute ceremony years and years ago. But the relationship just isn't there anymore. Their holy wedlock has become unholy deadlock. And we don't want to be like that in our relationship to the Lord. We don't ever want to let it go stale. I mean, we're human and we sin, we mess up, we make mistakes, we make bad decisions, and those things need to be dealt with. And I thank God Jesus dealt with them on the cross with his blood, but I need to apply that in my life and in all my relationships. Not just when I'm scared, but each and every day. There's no better, no sweeter relationship than the relationship with the Lord. And when we love him, we want to draw near. We want to fellowship with him. We want to know him better and better and better. Before we go any further, this is a good time to subscribe to our channel. Give us a like. Also, and share this video with a friend or loved one who would benefit from these weekly, very basic Bible teachings and lessons. Thank you so much. That means so much to us. Now, point number one, neglect brings dysfunction and destruction. If we neglect a relationship, it withers. If we neglect our marriage, it loses its life, its energy, and zeal. There's literally a name for that. It's called anaclytic depression. It comes from being neglected, loneliness, and feeling abandoned. You know, when we look at the turmoil, the division, and sins in our nations, and we can recognize that that's the result of our nation neglecting its relationship denying our relationship with God and even openly being hostile to the God who loves us so much and who has blessed our nation in the past and who wants to bless us now and in the future if we'll turn to him as a people. Right now, we have so many people blaming other groups of people for how our country is struggling and faltering. Many Christians can point out all the various groups and individuals who are making it worse and worse and worse and feel like if we could just deplatform those people or get them to be quiet, everything will be okay. Well, the problem is greater than that. The problem is people's various failings and, in many, their intentional rebelling against God. And what strikes me is that in recent times in particular, the people in the church, the people who are supposed to be God's people, look and talk and act like the people they're pointing their fingers at. They're indulging in the same sins and are even open about it, where maybe in times past they would have been doing these things, but they'd be at least ashamed a little bit and covering them up a little bit. Either way is wrong, but now there's not even any shame about it. And they're pointing to everyone else in the world while their lives and their behavior is no better than the other people's. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13 and 15, it says, From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, 
Everyone is given to covetousness, from the prophet even to the priest. Every one of them deals falsely. Then God says, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, and neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. And at the time I visit them, they will be cast down, says the Lord. That's Jeremiah 6, verse 13 and 15. God's people were just as greedy and covetous as the people they were looking down on and mad at. They had lost their sense of shame. They weren't even embarrassed about the things they were doing and the things they were involved in. They just shrug it off and say, well, you know, God knows I'm only human or everybody does it or something like that. Listen, I can tell you, it's not a lack of truth, not a lack of knowledge. We have an amazing amount of resources available. Bibles and every translation and paraphrase you can imagine. And then even on our phones, we have it. So we're never without access to the Bible and what God's heart is for his people. We have some incredible preachers and teachers and instructors available and millions of videos and websites and Facebook pages where we can find plain and clear gospel truth. But the problem is that people turn away from it and they shrug it off when the Spirit of God is applying it to their hearts. The people in Jeremiah's day said that they would never come under God's judgment. They would never have to suffer consequences for their behavior. Their nation had been rich and powerful and prosperous, but that prosperity had become a trap. It had become poison. It had become a numbing agent to them. Point two is that God's patience isn't slackness. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says that God is not slack concerning his promise. As some people count on him being slack, but he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is very patient. He waits for people to turn from their wrongdoing and to return to him. He's patient with us as individuals and patient with us as a nation. But when a person or a people, a nation, hardens their heart and continues doing just as it has been doing, God begins to let the consequences of that flow. And God said there in Jeremiah that it was not just the people, but it was the priests and the prophets as well. Can you imagine that? Sure, you don't even need to imagine it. They were so covetous. They'd gotten used to the money flowing, that lavish lifestyle, that they would say whatever they needed to say to keep that flow going. And I can tell you, nothing has changed in that regard. There are many leaders, and I'm so sad to say many pastors, who are living contrary to the Word of God, and they continue to say whatever the people want them to say so they can stay in power and keep the money flowing. And God doesn't wink at that. God doesn't ignore that. It's because of the lack of godliness among people who claim to be Christians and their lifestyles that many want nothing to do with God because of that, and they mock the name of Jesus. But I want you to know that God is still seeking those who will serve him, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth, like Jesus told the woman at the well in John's Gospel, chapter 4. You know, we can look at the violence, the lies, the corruption of the world, and we can also know that we have an open door. We have open access to the throne of God, and he will hear us even though he's being patient. I was reading in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 12 where Daniel had been praying for his nation and his people, and it seemed like God wasn't doing anything. Listen to this. God said to Daniel, from the very first day that you set your heart to understand and to be clean before your God... Your words were heard, God says, and I have come because of your words. That's in Daniel 10, verse 12. Point number three, we need to deal with our own hearts and lives. I mean, how are we doing? How am I doing? We need to go beyond pointing out the sins and faults and schemes of others, and we need to come to God with our own failures and problems and own them. Jesus warned us not to be like the Pharisee who thought he was good and the problem was the other side. Jesus talked about the Pharisee and the publican that both went into the temple. And the Pharisee was up there thanking God that he wasn't like other people, or in fact, like that publican back there. But the publican, I didn't say Republican, wouldn't lift his eyes up to heaven and just cried, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I do wrong. You may not do all the things that the other people are doing, but we all have our issues. We all have our problems. We all fall short of God's glory or of God's dream, God's goal for our lives. And there are Christians who condemn the sins of our culture, but actually indulge in many of those same ones. And 
even enjoy the ones that they can practice in the privacy of their own homes when they think nobody knows about it. And there's no one who doesn't slip up, no one who doesn't fall for some lie of the devil here or there. But the difference is, how do we respond? We need to bring our problems to God, bring our failures to God, bring our sins to God, to find cleansing, to find forgiveness, to find strength to move beyond those cycles of sinning and repenting over and over again for the same things. We know that God doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that whoever comes to Jesus will not be turned away. Jesus said that in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 37. And when we bring ourselves to God, when we bring our problems and our messes to God, He will receive us and He will hear us and He will cleanse us and He will purify our lives. Point five, coming before God in prayer. The only way America or any country for that matter to get hold of God is to lift it up before God in prayer. It's called intercession. That's what the prophets did. Jeremiah, Ezra, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of them. And God heard from them in heaven and he responded. And these men and women of God that we find in the Bible know the problem is too deep to be cured at the ballot box or by more legislation or GoFundMe or whatever else. You can't legislate sin because it's in the human heart, in the realm of the spirit. If every sin in the world was made legal, but every child of God was faithful to God, and there is national revival, international revival, people simply wouldn't indulge in those sins. It's that simple. But when it's trying from the outside to get people to live right, it fails every time because people find loopholes and they will do whatever evil there is in their hearts. And we need prayer. We need intercession. We need true revival. I didn't say we need church growth. I didn't say we need more mega churches. We need people whose hearts are turned to the Lord for real. And God will do that if we turn to him. Point six, you might be living with heartache right now, maybe from your own behavior or because of somebody else's. There may be something in your life that's painful. It's hard and it grieves you. You know, you can bring that before God and put your heart and your life in his hands. That's the place to examine your life and ask him, is there anything, God, that I need to see? Anything I need to say? God, is there anything I need to do? Is there anything I need to stop doing? God, is there anything I'm not dealing with or that I'm making excuses for? And then bring that for the Lord, for him to deal with. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for your loved ones. Pray for your church. Pray for your nation. Pray for us. You know, as a nation, we've had plenty of trauma and bad decisions, and we need to heal. Many of God's people have a lot of bitterness where they've been wounded and hurt, and we need to bring that before God as well and ask him to touch our hearts with his healing hand. There are things that we need to stop carrying and things that we need to bring before God and just let it go. Let God deal with that root of bitterness that we may have been nurturing and carrying around for years. We need to forgive and let God do justice and deal with all the unfairness. You know, I had to find that me being hurt and bitter didn't make anything or anyone any better. I had to learn to bring it before the Lord and leave it there. In Luke chapter 15 or verse 10, Jesus says that there's joy in heaven when a person repents. To repent means to change your mind, change your heart, come to God for healing and come to God for forgiveness, for cleansing and transformation. And it brings God great joy when a person comes to him and brings their sins and problems to him. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, I love this verse, says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's a strength when you get your joy from your relationship with God. And our God is a joyful God. He's a cleansing and a forgiving God. God's not going to put you to shame. Don't ever think that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 that we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for what? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And God put our sins, he put our shame on Jesus when Jesus went to the cross. And when you're forgiven, the Bible says that you are a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things become new. We don't have to carry that shame anymore. When Jesus went to the cross, he carried your sins. He carried my sins and the sins of the world. He takes our sin and our shame and he's never going to bring that up again. He's never going to put you to shame. Your God will never put you to shame. I pray that this word encourages you 
and that the Spirit of God will lead you to come into the presence of God through prayer. So you bring your cares, your problems, your issues, your sin, your shame, bring all of it into his presence and leave it there. And I pray that you will be filled with the cleansing, refreshing presence of God and the joy of your salvation, which is your strength. And I just thank you so much for being with us here today and for your prayers, for your support and your caring for us. God bless you. We hope you were blessed, inspired, and challenged by what you heard today. And we pray that God spoke some inspired truths into your heart. This ministry is supported by your gifts and donations. If you'd like to help us spread the good news, you can give at our website, www.theworshipcenter.org. Or you can text to give at 301-637-0777. It's easy and takes only seconds to set up. Thank you for listening and God bless you and your family.